I knew that I had entered territory that I knew nothing about. The military were telling us, we're going to neutralize you. In other words, we're going to kill all of you. And my dad owes his life to amnesty. And I think in many ways to the dedication and commitment of one particular volunteer. support their agenda, then you were an enemy. I knew, as a matter of fact, that they were really looking for me, that uh, my life was uh, at risk. I knew that they were kidnapping people since early 1975. They actually approached us and uh, I, I handcuff us and ask us to accompany them. And that's when the nightmare started. I knew that people going to the D2 had uh, disappeared. That night, I mean, they took me into a room where I was completely naked and they used electric shocks. They were fooling around with a knife with my private parts. They will come and put me a gun in the mouth and tell me, okay, that's it. I mean, and, but nothing will happen. We'll go click. At this point, of, uh, we are completely isolated uh, from the rest of the world. And so uh, being there, knowing that the, no one can see you, no one can talk to you, and little by little, it start, you start to feel the, the consequences of that toll, of that isolation. In one of those visits, suddenly my mother tells me that there is uh, this group, Amnesty International, that uh, had adopted me as a prisoner of conscience. And that was a turning point. Suddenly, I mean, you realized. That there is hope. And that there was this lady by the name of uh, Meve Porter, who was uh, actively involved and responsible for, for the case. I simply am not a person who likes to sit at a distance. I want to be there, even at risk, and then contribute if I can. No letters could go directly to Nestor in prison. So this is my nom de guerre, this is my, my name that I used, Laura Almira Mandel. Just, you know, as much, what can I say, subterfuge as possible, right? The seconds go by and turn into years. I would like to cry out so that you, you in general, and, and, and this would be amnesty, Escuchen so that you can hear it. I knew that virtually every single step that I was going to take was extremely dangerous. So I stayed with Nestor's mother, Dora Ibar, and she protected me in many ways. So as I was accumulating materials, I realized, um, okay, I've got a lot. I need to leave again. And I go back to Brazil, and back to the United States, and come back to Argentina. And so I did that several times. At 
just about 1.30 in the afternoon on July the 14th. They tell me to get ready, that I'm going to be released. And I was supposed to be visited that day by my mother. And uh, instead they tell me that uh, they are going to let me go. So he walked that with tears streaming down his face. And of course, horrendously thin. And, and finally I got there and then there, my mom was there, of course, uh, so excited. I was kind of like a, a shock also. Of course, he hugs his mother for quite a while. And then she introduces me. She turns to this uh, lady and she said, oh, and let me introduce you to your cousin, Dayanita. That, that was Mev, of course. We were introduced with the typical kiss on each cheek. And then we realized that we were both reading the same book. And the book was Ulysses by James Joyce. So that's a, a coincidence that, I mean, we always were kind of like amazed. I mean, we were both uh, reading Ulysses. Suddenly we became really very close uh, friends and, uh, and that friendship uh, developed into uh, starting a family. Here I am as a pregnant woman. When you look at that, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that I am going to have a child. When he came, I mean, he gave me that uh, second shot of energy that I needed in life. And I always uh, wanted to have a child. So, so Jonathan uh, was the realization of all these uh, dreams that I always had in, in life. My dad's courage standing up to a number of atrocities that were taking place and my mother's choice to step forward and sacrifice uh, was something that I carried with me in my work uh, from the, the first days to now. They gave me an opportunity in a lot of ways to continue on that struggle, to continue on that fight for, for good that they both so dearly believe in. Uh, and I've had that opportunity to carry that on in places like this building behind us. I was there at the same uh, age that my dad had just ended up in political prison uh, in my early 20s. He is the product of the efforts of all these people and all over the world that actually made it possible this outcome. Huh? And that's amnesty. That's amnesty. So this, this picture here, yes. this is right after your release. <laughs> That's right after. Like the one week after I was released, or less than a week. So you had just been released after four years in political prison with yeah. the woman who had worked on your case to get you released. Exactly. <laughs> Jonathan, here is your very own copy of Ulysses by James Joyce that we are bringing your dad and I to give to you to carry on into the next generation. Thank you guys. I think this book and the idea of this means so much because it's what was the first symbol of your meeting after such an incredible struggle. So dad, dad's inscription I can hear in your voice the echo of that young man who in the 1970s wanted to change the world. I know that you'll never give up, mi querido hijo, dad. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And then mom's inscription is, Jonathan, you are my motivation and joy. Your birth was the beginning of my life as mother. Je t'aime mon fils, for now and forever, mom. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you. This is something that I carry with me is the continuation of, of everything you guys believe in, in in these pages. Thank you for this. I love you both so much. Thank you. Love you too. I love you, Thank you guys so much. I love you both. Thank you for giving me this. This is very, very special. <laughs>